Good morning, everybody. Let's stand now as we sing our introit, fresh as the morning, and how appropriate is it? is the way, the truth, and the life. Transform our hearts and make us aware of Jesus' presence around us and especially within us. Welcome, everybody, on this fresh winter morning. Welcome in friendship, welcome in faith, and welcome in God's all-inclusive love. Now, this was a morning well worth getting out of bed for, wasn't it? Come on. The drive in this morning was spectacular. The snow on the trees and the sun sparkling off of it, it was just wonderful. Barbados couldn't even hold a candle to it, now could it, Len? <laughs> well, it certainly is good to be back this morning. I know I had a little chat with Judy White this week, and she said that she was talking to Cheryl Domain, and they were all saying the same thing, that when church was canceled last week, we were a little off. We kind of lost our rhythm, didn't we? Because Sunday has a way of grounding ourselves, uh, not only in the day, but the, it anchors our week ahead. I remember my grandmother always said, make the church steps the first steps of your week. And I thought that was pretty good advice. So um, in our thank yous this morning, I received a card, actually Cheryl Domain gave it to me, and it's from the Salvation Army. And they want to thank everybody for your support for the food bank, not only during Christmas, which helped a lot of families um, during the holidays, but all throughout the year. So your help and your support is recognized and is very much appreciated. And while we're still on the thank yous, Jean Fairhall also sent a nice little note saying thank you to the Christmas elves for the nice little Christmas baskets that were sent out. So these little goodie bags were really appreciated and really brought the light of Christ into people's lives that who ordinarily would not be able to be here and to be present at Christmas. Now, what else? I'd invite you to look at your announcements. Now, <laughs> there's a little confusion about the pancake supper. So the pancake supper is going to be on Wednesday, Valentine's Day. So it's going to be Valentine's pancake night, and we are looking for volunteers, if possible, to help flip the pancakes and to fry up some sausages. So if this is something that uh, you're able to do, we would certainly love to have you um, sign up for it. And following the Pancake Supper, we will be having an Ash Wednesday service, the official beginning of Lent. Yes, we haven't got Christmas packed away and we're talking about Lent. So um, yes, we will um, be doing that on Wednesday. So you might make a note of it. Now, I also have to say a very special welcome to Desi. Desi's here this morning. She's here with Canoe. I can't tell you how many phone calls I had from Canoe this week telling me that Desi was coming and Desi was going to see the snow and <laughs> Desi was going to be out playing in the snow because Desi's from the Philippines. And of course, this snow is a whole new experience. So, uh, not totally, but, uh, oh, 20 years. Oh, okay, but up here, you mean? Yes, yes. Well, Canoe was more excited about Desi coming than Santa Claus, I'm sure. 
So it's lovely to have you here, Desi, and uh, we hope that you feel welcome. And if there are any other visitors this morning, we trust that the service will be a blessing to you and that you will be a blessing to others this coming week. Now, Jeanette, I know you have an announcement, a plea. So we have some wonderful light beamers and we have three amazing leaders and we have four, five volunteers. It's not enough. If we can get 12, 13, once every three months, you spend 40 minutes with the kids, with support. And it is amazing what they come up with. So please, 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 if you can give up one Sunday morning of hearing wonderful Diane, who you can hear the next day, to be with our wonderful children, please talk to me. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Emery. Ah. Oh. Just a reminder that our annual reports are due on January the 31st, so if you haven't already gotten those reports in, Linda will be looking in her email box for those. And I come bringing good tidings of great news. Our budget for 2024 has been approved. And guess what? We ended the year in the black. We even have a surplus, so come on, give yourself a hand. Thank you to everybody who has contributed and continuing to contribute to ensure that the ministry here at Trinity United Church continues to grow and flourish. And uh, with a little bit of money that we had left over, we're going to pay off some bills. And we're going to pay off the bill for the repairs in the hall, the, the roof in Trinity Hall. So great news there. So let's, um, okay. In our joys and concerns, in our joys, Sheila Givens. Sheila had her hip replaced there um, just the week before last. I had a little visit with her on the phone. She's doing well. Her family is with her, and she's doing all her physio exercises, and she's hoping to get back to church as soon as possible. And Jean Reynolds. Jean Reynolds has moved from her home, and she's now settling into Rogers Cove. I went to visit her and her was standing room only in her suite. The family was there. They were on the way to or from the cottage, I'm not sure which. And she seemed to be um, settling in quite nicely and she does have a new phone number. So if you're interested in giving her a call, just call Susie next week and she'll pass along her phone number. And a big shout out this morning to Shirley Neal. Shirley was a longtime member of Trinity United Church and she now lives in Sarnia, but she comes together every week to celebrate God's presence here with you folks at Trinity, thanks to the magic of technology. And speaking of our online worshipers, we owe you a big apology out there in Churchland because I know you are all looking for the service and the service that never happened last week. So the next time we'll be sure to post something letting you know as well that church has been canceled. So we're always learning and growing. In our concerns, Jean Fairhall's younger brother, David, he was due to have some major heart surgery this coming Tuesday. I got a note from her last night and he was moved into ICU. So she doesn't know if the surgery is gonna go ahead or not but it certainly is a critical time for Jean and her family, so it would be wonderful if we could hold them in our healing prayers as well. And um, just a quick question, how are we doing with our word or our phrase of intention for the new year? How are we doing? Did everybody manage to pick a word, a phrase? I'm getting some, see I'm speaking to the choir up here. <laughs> Yes, so who, yes, Lynn, what's your word? Peace. Peace. Anybody else like to share their word? Diane? Gratitude. Gratitude. Mindfulness. Mindfulness. Attitude. Hopeful. Hopeful. Grateful. Grateful. Joy, did I hear joy? 
That was you, Emery. Okay. <laughs> Joy. That's a great word. Anybody else? Blessed. Blessed? Joanne, blessed. Yes. Love. Love. Thank you, Reach. Love. So you still have time. And you know, you can change your word halfway through the year. If you feel like you've grown out of that word or grown out of that intention, you can shift it and change it as well. Now, we're going to do something a little bit different as we go into the new year. We're going to dive a little deeper. And remember at Epiphany that God was revealed in the Christ child. Well, God is revealed every day in our ordinary lives, and I want you to be on the lookout for God sightings during the week. Where did God show up for you this week? Where did love show up for you this week? Now, you might not be able to answer this question off the top of your head right now, but I want to prepare you because I'm going to be asking you this next week as well. Well, not next week. I'm not here next week. Wherever Nina is going to be filling in for me next week. Hi, Nina. So would anybody like to share a God moment from the past week? Where God or where love may have shown? Lynn. I needed some money. We had a woman living in our parking lot and in the table the bank. She was living in her car. And we couldn't have that when she's 20 below and 23. And uh, I drove in the parking lot and pulled out about uh, pulled in at the same time in the truck. And he peeled off $250 when I told him the story. And that was a God moment. There you go. Beautiful. You see, God is not just here on Sunday mornings. God is out there in the world. Because God works through each and every one of us, just like he did for Lynn when he drove in in that truck and helped that woman who was living in her car. Anybody else? God moment? Think about that now. I want you to broaden your lens this coming week. I want you to really look for where God shows up in your everyday lives. Now it's time to light our Christ candle. So I'm going to invite our light beamers to come forward to do that important job for us. Okay, so hold hands. Everybody hold hands there so we can all connect and you hold on to my you hold on to my sleeve there. And may the light of Christ shine around us, within us, and especially through us. Amen. Okay, we'll see you in a few moments, okay? Now let's just take that moment of quiet, that moment of solace that you've been longing for all week. Just be where your feet are. Breathe. Take in a couple of deep breaths. And as you exhale, let the worries and the angst of the week that is passing, let it go. And be here in this precious God-given moment. It's good to be here in our faith community, whether we're here in person or online. Let us center our minds on the love in our hearts so that we may be a beam of light to whomever we meet today and in the week ahead. And when you are ready, you may slowly return to the rest of the service. Join me now in the call to worship and prayer of approach as printed inside your order of service and as will appear on your screens at home. Companions of faith, we come into this sacred space every week and we bring with us our joys and concerns. We are here because like the disciples Jesus called to join his mission, we too 
are called. Remind us once more as followers of Jesus, we commit to being gate openers and not gate keepers. Our hearts welcome all God's people in this place. We celebrate this gift of welcome and We are all part of our grand human family. Our opening hymn on this bright, beautiful Sunday morning, all are welcome in this place. Your More Voices hymn book, number one. Elsie, it's nice to see you up there in the balcony this morning. Welcome back to you. Nice to see you up there. 
Join me now in the opening prayer as printed inside your order of service. Let us pray. Welcoming God, you have freely accepted us just as we are. We do not have to fit into any kind of restrictive boxes or wear any oppressive labels. Yet we know sometimes we can be gatekeepers. We want people to fit into our boxes. Forgive us when our fear of diversity causes us to exclude anyone who doesn't look like us or act like us. Help us to be more like Jesus. He was never a gatekeeper. He is the welcoming open gate who reveals the acceptance, love, and grace for everybody. Let this be so for us. Amen. Our light beamer song now, as we remain seated this morning, is to the tune of Jesus Loves Me, and it's called Shining with God's Light. We'll sing it twice, and on the second round, our children will come forward. that they belong. 
and that they can be your friend because and love them exactly because before you and Emery met, you didn't know each other. Like you were strangers, and now you visit one another, and you're friends. I had no exactly. You didn't have that time. My hair was long. When she well, you think on that. You think on that, and we'll get on. I think I'm now. Okay. okay. Well, you know, Jesus teaches us that even though we come in all shapes and sizes and colors and we dare wear different kinds of clothes, we are all part of God's family. Okay? So let's close our eyes and talk to God, okay? Thank you, God, for this day, for our friends here at church and at school. Help us to reach out to those who may not be like us and let them know that they're okay and that we would like to be their friend. Jesus welcomes everybody and so do we. Amen. Okay, so let's stand up and give the congregation our blessing. May the peace of Christ be with you. Okay. Hey, we did. Hold it. Well, you have it now, so you can hold it. That was very nice of you to offer, though. Let's move in very closely. Make sure you use your big voices. May the peace of Christ be with you. One, two, three. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
I invite you to pray. May the words of the scripture transform our minds and may the work of your spirit transform our hearts and illuminate our lives. Amen. Scripture today is from John chapter 10, seven to 10. In the 10th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus uses a strange combination of metaphors to describe his message and mission. He refers to himself as the good shepherd and as the gate, sometimes translated as the door. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Hear what the Spirit is saying to our hearts. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our light and our open gate. Amen. Gatekeepers. What's the first image that comes to your mind when I say that word, gatekeeper? We run up against gatekeepers all the time, don't we? We live in a world where there are gatekeepers for just about everything. In more traditional forms of Christianity, Jesus is seen as the ultimate gatekeeper. One evangelism strategy is to ask a specific question. If you were to die tonight, do you know where you were going? And another question asked is, are you saved? Now, everyone was either in the group who knew that they were going to heaven or knew that they were saved or they were out. We even have that image of St. Peter at the pearly gates, at the entrance of heaven, deciding whether people were allowed to enter or not. Some people feel that St. Peter was the ultimate gatekeeper. Writer John Vandelar says it's shocking that Jesus has been placed at the top of the pile as the chief gatekeeper guarding eternity with rigid determination to keep sinners out. This is a form of Christian theology that I prefer to leave in the past. Why? Allow me to spend the next few minutes explaining why we within the United Church of Canada may see things a little differently. All the Gospels describe how Jesus called a group of disciples to follow him, to learn his ways, to share his mission and his message with the world. What we often miss is that the people that Jesus chose were not part of his society's in-group. They were fishermen. They were entrepreneurs. They were tax collectors. In fact, they were the least likely people to be chosen to follow Jesus. Jesus was so welcoming and so inclusive in his choice of followers that it upset the religious authorities and it angered the priests of the day. They were offended. They were offended because he wasn't being enough of a gatekeeper. He was allowing people in that his opponents and other religious authorities felt that he should have kept out. In John's Gospel, as Jeanette read this morning, we hear Jesus calling himself the gate. And this can very easily be confused with Jesus calling himself a gatekeeper. 
But when, as writer Vandelaar suggests, we read the entire passage in which the metaphor is used, we discover a very different perspective. In verse 9, Jesus says, Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in, they will go out, and they will find pasture. Notice these words, whoever come in and come out. Vandalar says Jesus is not describing a closed image of a gatekeeper, but rather an open image, an open door, where there is no gatekeeper. Jesus is the gate of the sheep, but he is an open, welcoming, inviting gate, and the sheep come in and go out freely. And the purpose of this gate is so that they can have life and have it to its fullest. It's so unfortunate that people who profess to be followers of Jesus are self-proclaimed gatekeepers. They feel they're called to be gatekeepers of God's life and love. They feel they're in charge. Sadly, the reputation of followers of Jesus or Christians outside the church is that we are known more for what we are against than what we are for. And in the more conservative Christian denominations, they are known for who they exclude rather than they welcome. We can see this almost daily in the United States. Some conservative Christian streams are known for defending ancient beliefs that fly in the face of insights of science. They are anti-abortion, anti-gay, anti-science, anti-evolution. But there is more than one way to believe. And I'm happy to say that Trinity United Church is not singing this theme song. We are walking a different path, a more inclusive path where the gate is flung wide open for everybody. Jesus didn't exclude anybody and neither do we. We are on a path of becoming an affirming congregation and Thelma Beaudry will have more to say about this in a few moments. You know, there are so many voices in our world that tell us that we don't belong. There are so many voices inside of us telling us that we don't deserve to belong. But the good news this morning is Jesus is the open gate for you, for me, for everybody. Whoever enters can come and go and find pasture. We can have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is the open door which allows us to come in to find the peace and security and hope that we're looking for. And that door or that gate will never be shut, no matter who you are or what you've done. And when this truth captures our hearts, when we, when we really start to understand what this means and we integrate it into our beings, we are changed. And something else happens. Our hearts start to grow larger. Our hearts grow softer. And we become more accepting. And then something else happens. We too become an open gate like Jesus. We become less concerned about what people look like, about what they wear, or who they sleep with. And we become more concerned about ensuring that every hurting, lonely soul has a place at life's table. Jesus was never a gatekeeper. 
and neither are we. Amen. Thelma Baudre. Thelma's going to give her closing arguments <laughs> on why Trinity United Church should become an affirming congregation. Thelma. Good morning. I promise this is the last time you will have to put up with me, right? I, I wanted this, the focus of this is to be, okay, start over, Thelma. I have heard so many people say, what is it going to look like? What does it mean if we become affirming? And so I wanted, these are my thoughts and my response to those questions. I think it, it, it starts with understanding that this church is not our church, it's God's church, and it belongs to everyone, not us. And as Diane says, we are not to be the cape, gatekeepers to decide who gets to come and who gets to stay. Our church is about love, and as a, an affirming congregation, we're going to say that. We're going to be public about our, our beliefs that everybody in this world, regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of their color, regardless of their mental health capa capacities, whatever, they belong here and they deserve to be loved. Churches have been historically the loudest and most hateful in messages about sexual orientation. And the LGBT community knows that. And to ask them to say, you know, we're gonna be different means that we need to walk the walk and talk the talk. We need to tell them that we're different, that we love them that we accept them. I can remember my brother, as you all know, is, is gay and, and he has this friend, Charles, it's gotta be one of the most awesome gentlemen I've met in my life. And we were sitting talking one day and he was an ardent member of an Anglican church. But he said, you know, I would sit there and I would look at the stained glass windows and I would listen, and that's why he went, he wanted to celebrate his faith but he would look around him and he would know in his heart that he was not accepted by that denomination of, of Christianity and it hurt because he didn't feel like he belonged they accepted him they loved his financial donations every week right but they had a hard time honoring his husband they had a hard time saying the words that gays and lesbians were accepted and he knew always that he was different. I think it's so important that everyone understands that this is not a place of judgment. This is not a place of judgment. This should be a place of celebration of everybody. I have not met a woman in my in all the years that I've worked with women, I have not met anybody who doesn't hope that when their children grow up, that they get to express who they are as God created them, right? We need to make space for that. And I think that one of the barriers for, for that at times are the secrets that we keep. When Doug came out, I can remember my mother said, well, that's fine, I'll love you no matter what, but please don't let me see you on TV walking in the pride parade. Please don't tell the world, right? And I'm thinking, well, mom, why don't you just stick them in a room somewhere, right? I can remember not wanting to tell my friends, not because I was ashamed of him, but because I wanted to protect him. I didn't want anybody to judge him. And I came to learn that that is not okay because it's not, Silence and secrets promote difference, promote division. It gives space for people to hate and condemn. 
I know that for myself, at times I was afraid to tell people that I was a Christian because I can remember sitting and listening to sermons where I can remember being told that developmentally challenged individuals will never go to heaven because they're not going to be allowed because they don't have the capability to make a personal decision to follow Jesus. And I'm thinking, but God created them. He created them and you're telling me that they can't go because they don't have the capacity. I don't want any part of that. And I left the church for a long time and courtesy of my loving husband and this place, I'm back because I get to hear messages of love here. So what are we going to do? The, the affirming process has really been focused on, on sexual orientation and gender identity, but it's not the only focus. We will be working to include all forms of justice, racism, anti-poverty, addictions, mental health, all marginalized populations who are somehow found less than in the world around us. And I'll tell you, for me, it is very difficult uh, of late listening to the messages that are in this world now. The wars that are going on, um, the Christian populations in the states that are basically telling you that you're somehow not, not uh, qualified to be anything except an outcast. The amount of hate that's in this world right now is just, it's really hard for me. I, but I come in this building once a week, I listen to Diane, she ends the message every week with be kind to each other. And I think, thank God, I can be here that I can go out in this world and know that somewhere in this world, people that love each other exist. We just need to counter that hate with love and acceptance. And it begins with learning to listen. When I worked in the shelters in, in Mississauga, I'd often go through the dining room and there would be four different dialects being spoken in there. But when you, when you learn to listen, Regardless of your differences, we have so much in common with each other. So much in common. The woman from different countries would be sitting there saying, I don't want to be hit anymore. I don't want to hurt anymore. I want freedom for my kids. It didn't matter what part of the globe that they came from, but their language of their hopes and dreams was the same, regardless of the words that they used to express it. And I think that you will, I'm hoping that we will find that regardless, it doesn't matter the sexual orientation. My brother loved his husband dearly. And it's about love. It's about creating family. It's about learning to share what we have in common with each other. I think how we do that is it's, the limit is our imaginations, our internet. Uh, somebody made it. Um, I remember thinking, oh my God, at the age of our congregation, I don't think we're going to get people marching in the pride parade, right? Like, I, I don't know that we can do that, but I know that people who are competent with a computer can put it on our Facebook page. I don't know how to use Facebook. I don't know how to do it. I don't check it. But I know someone in this building does, right? And I know that the leaders of this church can figure out how to do that. We can make a phone call to Muskoka Pride and we can say that we are an affirming congregation. What can we do to support you? We can um, decide in when we're developing our programs. I, at one point, sat and cried in the, uh, in the pews and the choir had, it was just one of those really special moments for me where the, the songs that they chose to sing that day were representative of this issue. And I, I thank you, that was a long time ago, mind you, but that, that was 
everything that we do, if we do it through a lens of anti-oppression work, we got it made. If we can celebrate St. Patrick's Day with a dinner, we can celebrate Pride Month with a dinner, right? Like there is space and room. For me, um, for me, this is a way of stopping division, right? It's not about them. It's about an us, a world where everyone belongs. And I think there is an ever-growing need to work towards success, uh, understanding and acceptance. I think sometimes that it's really hard. Uh, <laughs> when I started telling the world that I was a feminist and I had a different perspective on life, I got to tell you, it was not meant, met particularly well by some individuals. And so be it, right? But anti-oppression work means that we need to be, we need to speak, we need to say it out loud, we need to use the words. And it doesn't, like, you know, so somebody doesn't like that I'm a feminist, in the long run I get to go home and I get to be who I am, right? And I get to, to love people as I think that they should be loved and to be kind. And if that particular individual doesn't care for it, it's their loss. It's not my loss. It's not pleasant, but so be it. I, at one time, I got to tell you a couple of personal stories. I had gone to, I volunteered at an agency and I sit on their board and I had gone and I had the very first Syrian family that was being brought into into Huntsville and Derek was a minister at that time and he, um, the United Church here was co-sponsoring, not really sponsoring, but they were sort of like in there and, and monitoring what was going on. But the committee was members of Huntsville and I had gone to the board and we had money and I wanted money for it, right? And I asked for a donation and there was, our, our board, God, I love all of them, um, but I don't think they were used to someone coming along and saying, you know what, you got money sitting there doing nothing and I want it and this is where it's going to go. And at the time, one of them, and so generally people always went along with me, sooner or later. Um, <laughs> and there was no one that ever came out right and said no, right? And this particular individual said, I don't want to support that because I don't want my son to go to a public school and not be able to take a ham sandwich. And I thought, I've got to tell you, that did not set well with me. And I thought, okay. So I came and I joined this, the Syrian committee. And I thought, if you want information, I will go and I will join and I will have it all because I'm coming back. They didn't know that at the time. And the next meeting was held on Remembrance Day. And I went back and I said, well, I asked you for a thousand last time and I'm telling you I want two now. And it's Remembrance Day and I want, which is when we remember all our veterans and, the, and what they sacrificed for us to be here. But for every veteran that was sacrificed, some family was left without a father, some family that was left without a brother, without a son. The people in the war zones lost their homes and nobody remembers the wives and the kids that were, that were devastated by what they lost. These individuals are coming from Syria not because they necessarily really want to live in Canada, they just don't want to be bombed out. They want to live, they want to raise their family and they want to be safe and now I want $2,000, and I got it. And, um, and I think that's what we need to do. I think we need to fight back against discrimination, and I think it starts with communication and with love and acceptance. One last story I gotta tell you. So there is a, a home 
on on uh, Aspen Road on that I pass every time I go home, every time I come into town. And she, they have built a memorial to the residential school children that died, right, and the graves that were found. And it's basically, you know, every child matters. Bolton's outside, and it's a lest we forget memorial. And every time I, so when it first went up, it was you know. That story was in the newspapers all the time, and it was a topic of conversation. But time, like, goes on, and like everything, it gets buried or forgotten or whatever. And this memorial stayed. And so my first reaction, as I drove by it every other day, was like, really? You're going to leave that up forever? Like, that's going to be your front lawn or or ornaments, right? And it stayed. And it stayed. But what happened during that process is my change to the reaction of seeing that every day because I became to understand for me that this, this re reminder daily reminds me that I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to understand, to learn, and to accept. And although my family's not personally responsible for whatever happened in the residential schools. I need, I need to understand what my culture contributed to that way back when and make sure that it doesn't happen again. So we were, and this is a really unique property. It's the only property I've ever seen in all of Huntsville that has chain link fence all around with a gate at the front. And I thought, who does that up here? And we were driving by one day, and the family was down at the gate, and they were doing something in the driveway, and I asked David to turn around and go back. And I went up to this woman, and I said to her, you own this property? And she said, yes. And I said, I just wanted to thank you so much for this memorial. And I told her what it meant to me and what I've learned from it for myself over the year or so I'd driven by it. And she started to cry. And she said, you know, we believe in God. And she says, I think you're an angel that got sent to me today because I've just had to call the police on my son and I'm not doing well. And for you to come and tell me this, it meant a lot to her. And her husband came out and we talked about why they built these memorials and what it meant to them. And they said, it will be up here until we die, right? And I, and I sat there and I thought, how easy is it to reach out and touch somebody and to make them feel good, to make them feel included, to make them feel that what they have done has value. And I'm hoping if we agree to becoming an affirming congregation, it will be a journey of learning, of understanding, and a journey of love. And I thank you for putting up with me and listening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thelma, for shining your light into our world. The season of gift giving may be behind us, but as God's people, the season of giving never ends. Our morning tithes and offerings will now be received.
stand now as we sing our offering hymn. Just a footnote to Thelma's presentation. Trinity United Church will be voting on whether or not to become an affirming congregation at our annual general meeting at the end of February. And now as we remain seated, let us sing hymn number 400. Lord, listen to your children praying. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. <coughs> Divine designer, thank you for stepping into our world and revealing yourself to us through every created thing. Give us courage to step outside our comfort zones and to color outside the lines in order to meet others where they are. It may feel uncomfortable and awkward, but help us to do it anyway. Deepen our understanding of our need for a faith that goes beyond the superficial. Make us hungry for a faith that claims everybody as brother or sister. Inspire in us an open curiosity and lead us to deeper connections with others and help us to see our similarities as opposed to our differences. As we reflect upon the price of inclusion, may we be inspired to build bridges in the way of Christ. Help us to dismantle the walls surrounding those who see, think, live, love, and believe differently than we do. Empower us with courage to create communities, including right here at Trinity United Church, that reflect your dream of radical welcome, acceptance, and celebration. Give us the humility to step into the world of others and learn to love them as they are. This morning, we bring before you all those who are in need of your healing, comfort, and presence this week. We especially bring before you Jean Fairhall's brother, David Bryson, Sheila Gibbons, Barbara Stephen, Barbara Martin, slowly recovering from her lung illness over Christmas, 
Gord and Fran Mitchell, as they walked the road of loss after their son Scott died on New Year's. Jean Reynolds, who was adjusting to her new home at Rogers Cove after spending so many years in her family home. Gail and Graeme Allen, both struggling with health issues. Milt and Rick Waring, ongoing cancer treatments. David and Thelma Beaudry, ongoing health challenges for the last couple of months. And if you're listening to me today and you are feeling poorly and without hope, may you know that there is somebody that can hold the hope until yours returns. That you do not walk this road of life alone. That you are held. That you are always held. And now, in the silence of our hearts, we lift up to you our own personal cares and concerns. God, hear all our prayers, and in your love, answer. Now join me in the Lord's Prayer, an alternate version of the prayer of Jesus as printed inside your order of service. Eternal Spirit, pain bearer and life giver, source of all that is and all that shall be, with the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today, number 402 in your Voices United hymn book, We Are One.
spirit of God's inclusive love we have gathered, and now in the spirit of God's inclusive love, let us depart. And before we leave, I just want to remind you that we have a wonderful luncheon out there today. We have three different kinds of sandwiches. We have all kinds of different cookies. So if you don't have anything planned today, please stay behind and have a cup of tea and a sandwich and maybe get to meet somebody and chat with somebody that you haven't spoken to before. <coughs> and now may the warmth of God's comforting love surround you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And may the friendship of the Holy Spirit inspire and uphold you this day and forevermore. Amen.